to try the other live stream. Come to try the other live stream.
Hey, Harvest Time, thank you so much for your patience with our technical glitches. We are working on them. Hopefully you can hear this now. If you can't, please comment. Or actually, if you'll uh, just text me, that might be easier. I think we're live, and I think we've got sound. But if I'm wrong, please someone let me know. Uh, at this time, we're going to have uh, Josh come and share uh, kids' stories. So we'll do a little transition here. going in and having snacks with you so hopefully a couple of you are having snacks at home I'm pretty sure the Pettit boys are having snacks they usually do um, but we miss you here uh, but I want to share a couple stories with you guys um, just uh, a couple four real quick stories uh, if you were in Sunday school a couple weeks ago you already heard a little bit about this that we talked about it uh, in the group but this is for kids and also uh, parents too you, you should pay attention um, and talking to some of the kids and even mine I know some are a little nervous uh, or anxious about what's going on, you know, with everything going on right now, and we're kind of uncertain what will happen here. So I thought of a couple of stories I wanted to share uh, that would kind of help along with that. Uh, the first one is about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, wanted everyone to bow down to an idol that he had made. Um, if you didn't, you'd be thrown into a fire. Uh, those three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't want to do it. The king heard about it. And he actually turned uh, heat up the fire seven times more uh, than what it was before because he was so angry that they wouldn't do it. Uh, those three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they prayed to God and they trusted God uh, to protect them. Um, they were thrown in the fire. The guys actually threw them in. They died. It was so hot. And, um, the, next, and the king was watching um, and he saw them standing in there and they came out. And the only thing that was burned on them was just the ropes that tied them, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Um, and they had prayed uh, to God, and they trusted God would protect them. The next one is about Daniel. Uh, the king made a rule or a law that for 30 days you could only pray to him. Um, Daniel didn't like that idea, and he wanted to pray to, to our God. So he continued to pray to God three times a day. Uh, they found out about it. Um, they kind of pressured him on it. And Daniel uh, said he was only going to pray to his God. So they threw him into a den of lions. Um, and what did Daniel do? He prayed to God and he trusted that God would protect him. Daniel came out of that den with, uh, without a single scratch on there after spending a whole night in a den of lions. Uh, the third story I want to talk about is Jonah. Uh, God wanted Jonah to go somewhere he didn't want to go. Um, and Jonah tried to run away. Uh, he ended up getting on a boat and trying to escape God's plan and get away from God. A uh, big storm hit. Uh, the boat was bouncing all over in the waves. And, uh, and the people on the boat found out it was because of Jonah. So they actually threw Jonah overboard. Uh, God sent a fish to come and uh, swallow him. So it had to be a pretty big fish. I know Pastor Randy fishes. I don't know if he's ever caught a fish big enough to oh, yeah. swallow a person. Uh, but Jonah spent three days and three nights uh, in the belly of a fish. And what did Jonah do? Uh, he prayed. He prayed to God that he would protect them, that he'd get them through this and get them out safely. Um, and uh, he knew that God would, would protect him. Um, after three days and three nights of being in there, uh, the fish was conducted by God to go to shore and spit him out, and he ended up just fine. Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, the, the other story I want to talk about is this thing that we call coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, it shut down schools and work. It made many people sick. It made everyone stay at home. It has us watching church on a laptop and cell phones. Um, and it's changed a lot that we're doing right now. Uh, we wish we were in school. We wish that we still had sports. Um, but what do we need to do right now? From those three stories that we just learned about, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and Jonah, uh, we need to pray to God. We need to pray to God that he, that he will protect us, that he'll get us through this, and that we'll be back even better than when we started. Um, uh, Gilbert the other day talked uh, when he prayed, and, and someone asked, what are the three things that we should be doing in this? And they will pray, pray, and pray. And that's what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to add here, just on reading a couple of verses out of Psalms, and 
God. And I want you guys, I want kids to listen to the words of the Psalms. And I want you to hear, it's going to be real clear, of what we need to do and what God will do for us. The same God that saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a furnace. The same God that protected Daniel in the den of lions. And the same God that protected Jonah in the belly of a well will protect us from this virus. Okay, I'm reading from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be part of your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. You make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, that they will lift up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Kids, bow your heads with Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity that we can talk uh, about you. We can share stories of how you protected us in the past, and we can talk about stories of how you'll protect us in the future. We just pray that you continue to guide us and protect us. We pray for all these kids as they are maybe nervous um, or anxious about what's coming. I just pray that you'll, uh, you'll guide us and protect us and give us clarity in us. Give us a good rest of the day in your name. Amen. Amen. What a great message, Josh. What a great message for the kids and for us adults. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And, uh, when they looked into the furnace, it appeared that there was a fourth man in the fire, and that fourth man was Jesus himself. And so, uh, good news. Jesus himself is with us today, protecting us in the fire, or whatever you want to call this that we're in. So we're in a series at Harvest Time called What Matters Most, and the first week we, we talked about uh, character and how character really matters and the kind of character that we have. Uh, we want to have godly character, we want to have a character that causes us to look more like Jesus, and in this series we're talking about things that we really think are important, that really need to be operating in our lives, and when they are, they cause us to uh, walk in victory. And I believe that these principles will, that we're talking about will cause us to live in his victory and actually cause us to finish strong. How many want to finish strong? We want to finish our course. We want to finish the race. We want to run the race all the way to the end and finish strong. And these things, I believe, are going to help us to finish strong. So we talked about character the first week. Last week, we talked about people. How many of that people matter? And uh, people are so important. People matter to God. Jesus, you know, People matter so much to God that Jesus died for people, that God gave us all for people, and everything in life, I, I like to say it this way, that everything in life flows out of our relationships with people. Everything that we have, everything that, um, even our assets, I mean, the very our very lives flow out of relationships with people. And so people are so important to us, and the interesting part is, and I want to encourage you, whenever you get into a relationship with anybody, your attitude should be, what can I give to this relationship? Not what can I take, or what, how's this relationship with this brother or this sister going to bless my life? It should be, our attitude should be, how can my life be a blessing to this person? How can I bring some kind of value to this person that God is bringing me into relationship with? How can I be a blessing? And so, it's very important uh, People are very important. People matter. Today we want to talk about attitude. Attitude. If you were here with me this morning, I'd have you look at your neighbor and say, hey, what about your attitude? So at home or wherever you are right now, you can look at whoever you're sitting with and say, hey, what about your attitude? If you're sitting by yourself, look in the mirror and say, hey, what about your attitude? 
And is it time for an attitude adjustment? And I think it probably is for many of us. I think attitude really matters. It really matters what kind of an attitude we have, especially in a, in a time like this when you can say, we're in a stormy time. Uh, somebody said about the president that he's, he's a president who's in, in wartime right now. This is wartime. And really the enemy has engaged in war against us. And so what, what kind of an attitude do we have right now? So let's pray and let's pray that God would show us our attitude and help us with our attitude. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to learn your word and learn about principles that help us to, to live in victory. God, I pray that today you'd speak to us about attitude and Lord, show us that we need an attitude adjustment. I'm just going to say that we probably all need an attitude adjustment. So help us to adjust our attitudes and help us to, to live for you and express Jesus with a very lively, faith-filled attitude. In Jesus' name. A lot of people think that attitude is everything. And uh, it's more important than anything, more important than talent or ability. I guess I would say if I could have somebody that has a good attitude, a positive attitude, you know, that's, that's really an up person, I'd rather work with them than a talented person who has a bad attitude. So attitude is everything. Attitude is contagious. In the secular wor world, I think they recognize how crucial attitude is and Everybody recognizes it. You know, when you have a good attitude, it's so important. But when you have a faith-filled attitude and you look at things through the lens of scriptures, it brings attitude to a whole nother level. I mean, you're really stepping it up when you mix faith with your attitude. Joyce Meyer says, your problem is not your problem. Your attitude about your problem is your problem. <laughs> your problem is not your problem. Your attitude about your problem is your problem. I really believe that. Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind or let this attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The attitude that Jesus had. Jesus didn't get a bad attitude about anything or anybody. Uh, COVID-19 doesn't give Jesus a bad attitude. It doesn't scare him. How I many you know that this didn't sneak up on God and God knows what's going on in the world today. And he hears the cries that Josh mentioned. He hears the cries of his people. And he's, he's coming to our rescue and he's helping us in this thing. And, and uh, I'm not saying that we're Jesus, but how many know that if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, there should be some kind of similarity between us and Jesus. We're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And so we should express some of Jesus' heart in the way we live and the way our attitude is. So our attitude needs to come from our relationship with Jesus. It needs to flow out of our relationship with Jesus. That's where a good attitude really comes from. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, what you've got on the inside eventually finds its way to the outside. So your attitude is really a reflection of the inner workings of your heart. That's really what attitude is. If you've got a bad attitude, you've got something bad going on in your heart, and you're not really a, you know, receiving enough Jesus, enough word of God, enough faith to change your outer look. You know, your, your attitude will really be an, ex an expression of, uh, of joy, of peace, of, you know, somebody that's got a good attitude, man, you just like to be around them because they look good. The Bible says that it's, you know, when we have faith, when we know God, it's like a garland around our neck. It makes us look better. It makes us, you know, we look more approachable because of Jesus. And it really should be going on in our lives. And we don't have to operate, when we don't operate out of love, I should say, and we get a bad attitude about people, we're acting like we don't know God. Because how many know in 1 John, the Bible says, you know, God is love. And for those that know God, and, and, you know, are born of God, they know God. When we're born of God, we know God. God is love. And he that does not love does not know God, the Bible says. So when, when we don't act in a positive attitude, a good attitude toward people, we're acting like we don't know God. It's serious. When I was growing up, uh, my parents had a cabin up in northern Minnesota. We spent a lot of weekends in the summer up there. And uh, whenever it was really windy, my dad would want to go sailing. We had a small sailboat. And <laughs> it wouldn't be just a nice breeze, like an eight-mile-an-hour wind. It would be like when the white caps were this high and the wind was just howling. My dad would say, come on, Randy, let's go sailing. And I was about, I think I was about 10 or 12 years old when we used to do quite a bit of this. And when I got introduced to it, and I remember a couple times, just the windiest days ever, Dad says, let's go sailing. And we jump on the sailboat, and he sets the sail out, and basically when the wind is at your back, 
And it was, and we'd go right down the lake, we'd put the sail all the way out, and we'd just sit back, and that sailboat would just cruise. And, and we made it four miles down the lake in record time. I don't know how, fat, how long it took us, but we were at the end of the lake in no time. And we turned into the wind, and my thought is, Dad, how are we going to get back? This is not going to be good. And the wind is coming right in our face. And he said, well, he started explaining to me about tacking. And, you know, for a 10-year-old or 12-year-old boy, tacking seems like a long process. Because he said, we're going to have to kind of face the wind and let the sail, you know, fill with wind, but not too much to where you go right into the wind. you got to be a little bit at an angle. And then the sail hits the wind and it propels you forward at kind of an angle. So what you do is you go down this way, you turn, you go down this way. So you, you, you tack back and forth all the way up the lake. And I thought, man, this is going to take us all day. Guess what? It did take us all day. And so it was a long, a long journey. But let me, let me share with you a couple of things that I've learned about sailing then and, and really over the years. But the number one thing I'd say about sailing is the wind is your friend. The wind is your friend. Without any wind, you're not moving. Without any wind, you're dead in the water. And you could, you could say without any wind in your life right now, you don't grow. You don't grow, you don't move, you just, you're kind of sitting there. So really, we need some wind, we need some challenge, we need, we need something blowing in our face to keep us moving. And so the wind is your friend. Number two, facing the wind is exhilarating. Facing, facing the wind is actually fun. Facing the wind is exciting. That's what my dad loved so much about sailing is when you, when you sail into the wind, you basically get up on the side of the boat. Actually, we would have our bodies hanging over the edge of the boat, and the boat would be up at an angle like this with the sail catching the wind, and you're just hanging on, praying that the, the, it doesn't go all the way over. And you actually have a keel in the water, and a keel is the big thing that goes down uh, in the center of the boat, in a, of a sailboat, and it goes down fairly deep into the water and holds you, it steadies you, and oftentimes the keel is weighted, and it steadies you from going all the way over. And so you're, you're cooperating with the keel, you're cooperating with the size of the boat and the sail and the, and the wind, and big, you're just hanging on, baby. You're just fighting this thing, and your face is in the wind. It's exciting, it's exhilarating. Number three, facing the wind makes you stronger. Facing the wind makes you stronger. If you never have a challenge, Josh, if you never have a team that's better than you, you you're never going to get any better. You need to play some teams that are better than you. You need to play you know, some games that are tough. You need to have some things in your life that will cause you to dig in, to hang on, to, you know, you can't sit back and relax when you're facing the wind. When you're facing the wind, you're fighting. You're fighting to keep your balance. You're, every move is calculated and you have to be engaged. And the last thing I would say is, you don't want quitters, complainers, and whiners in your boat when you're facing the wind. Amen. Come on now. You don't want them in your boat. You want people that are going to stay the course. You want people that are going to hang in there, that are going to fight with you, that are going to hang on and dig in and, and just say, I'm not quitting. I'm not going back. I'm fighting this thing. I'm going all the way to the end. And so what I'm saying is that I'm saying the wind of adversity is blowing our lives. Sometimes we have things, we have struggles, we have challenges, we go through stuff, but with an attitude of faith in what God can do and what he's doing, you can remain strong and unafraid in the midst of a strong, even a strong wind. When your perspective is, look at my God. Look at how big my God is. My God is the king of the universe. My God is the creator of all things. My God is so awesome. There's nothing. We read the stories with Josh this morning. There's nothing he can't do. He can pull you from a fire. He can, he can, pull, he can create a, a fish big enough to swallow you and, and save you from it. I mean, he can do anything. And that has to be our perspective when we're facing the winds in life, the adversity that, that life can bring. He's the king of the universe. In him, you'll be fine. I was reading this week about the children of Israel, and I'm sure you've, you've read in, in Exodus the story about them coming out of Egypt, and, and they get to the Red Sea, and God opens up the Red Sea for them, and, and they cross on dry, on dry land, and, and Pharaoh and his army are swallowed up in the Red Sea, and all these miracles are happening, and right after they get out of there, and not, not long afterwards, they start to complain, they get an attitude. And they start complaining to Moses, Moses about being thirsty. And it's right after Miriam teaches them a song about how the horse and the rider has been swallowed by the sea and, and uh, God has brought them victory. And they start complaining about being thirsty. No water to drink. In Exodus 15, 24, you can read about that. And not longer after that, 
You know, God pulls water out of a rock. I mean, come on. Moses touches his staff on the rock and God causes water to come forth from a rock. Not long after that, they complain about having no food and they told Moses that they should have died by their pots of meat and stuffing themselves with bread in Egypt. Can you imagine? It sounds like, you know, we'd have, we'd have rather died from overeating than to be out here now. That's the kind of complaining that they were doing. They accused Moses of bringing them out in the wilderness to die, to perish, to starve to death. In Exodus 16, you can read about that. After that, God rains down quail and bread, manna, from heaven. And, you know, enough for them to eat every day. And they could, they could do it six days a week. And they could, they could take a little more on the seventh day for the seventh day. And God just provided everything for them. All they had to do was go out and pick it up and eat it. And, of course, in a short time, they complained about that. It's kind of blah, it doesn't taste that good, and eh. Uh, we, we'd rather be eating our onions and our garlic and stuff. And so you could ask, how, how, they, how could they experience such victory and provision from the Lord and still wind up whining and complaining soon afterwards? Isn't that a good question? Isn't it true for us as well? We have so much. God has blessed us with so much, so richly, and yet we complain so quickly. Wouldn't you like to ask the children of Israel some questions? I know I would. I'd like to ask them, what were you thinking? Sometimes don't you want to ask people that same question today? What were you thinking? Are you kidding me? Didn't God just bring you out of the Red Sea? How could you forget that so fast? I'd like to ask them too, didn't God just rain down meat from heaven? Man, I'm telling you, I wish he'd rain down some meat from heaven today. That would be great. Didn't he just rain down bread for you? Surely you know that he's with you. Didn't he cause water to come from a rock? Do you think he can get you water anywhere? If God can cause water to come from a rock, don't you think he can get you water anywhere? Let me ask you a couple questions today. Hasn't God always provided for you? Isn't he big enough to take care of you? Didn't Jesus say his eye is on the sparrow and that he cares for you? He said, why do you worry about your life? Why do you worry, why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear? Doesn't God provide? Doesn't he, he clothe the lilies of the valley? Doesn't he provide for, you know, a covering for the birds? Don't you think he's going to take care of you? Doesn't he even know the number of hairs on your head? I'm talking, that's intimate. He knows you intimately. He just doesn't know about you. He knows you intimately. He knows even the number of hairs on your head. Didn't he hang? Isn't this the same God that hung the stars in the sky? Isn't he the creator? of the whole universe? Didn't he create all things? Didn't he create every living creature? Isn't this the same God that we're talking about? Don't you think he can take care of you? Don't you think he can protect you even in this day that we live in now? So the, the big question for this morning is how can I change my attitude? How can I change my attitude? Again, I would remind you to remind yourself or the person next to you, listen up right now. Listen up right now. You need to change your attitude. It starts with, number one, changing your meditation. What are you meditating on? Is it God's Word? Uh, is it the greatness and the wonder of God that you're meditating on? Or are you meditating on your problems? Are you meditating how big the coronavirus is? Are you meditating on how big all your other problems are right now? And if you are, you need to start meditating on the Word of God. I want to share with you a, a few scriptures uh, the first one from Psalm 119, just some meditation scriptures. Psalm 119, 15 and 16. I will meditate on your precepts precepts, and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I will not forget your word. So we need to meditate on his ways, on his word, on his statutes. Psalm 104, 34. My, may my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. In the old King James, it says... My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Psalm 143, 5. I remember the days of old and meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. In other words, I really just, I just lay there and think about the work of your hands. What you've done, how you've provided, what you've done in the past, what you're doing in the world, how you've created everything. I just muse on it. I just, I chew on it. I sit on it. I think about it. Psalm 39, 3 and 4, my heart, this is a great one, my heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burn. Come on. My heart was hot within me 
while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. I mean, what happens when you meditate on God's word, when you meditate on God's ways, when you think about who he is and what he's done, there's a fire that begins to burn on the inside of you. Faith arises on the inside of you. Fear just diminishes it. You know, in the midst of that fire, that, that faith that's rising in you from God. And, and then you speak. And then you speak words of faith. And, and right here, he says, Lord, you know, help me to know my end. My days are short here. Make, help me to make the, the, the best of my time here. And I believe that we're living in a day when people are wondering and they're thinking about how frail I am. How, how small I am compared to the universe. How small I am, even in the light of this virus, it's like people, I pray that people are thinking about how frail we are right now and how small we are. In Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, uh, he says, well, it starts out in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And then it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the water, who brings forth his fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. When we meditate on God's word, you know, we'll be, we'll be fruitful. We'll bring forth fruit in season. And we'll, you know, our leaf won't wither. We won't get a bad attitude. We won't walk around all gloomy and like a dried up old oak leaf. But we'll be fresh and green and full of life. Ephesians 4, I'm just going to paraphrase this, 4, 23, and, or 22 to 24. Basically in 22 it says, to put off the old man and the old way of thinking. We need to get rid of that old way of thinking, that stinking thinking, that, that thinking that just meditates on the negative all the time. We need to get rid of that. In 23, it basically says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do we get renewed in the spirit of our mind? We get this word in, on the inside of us. Jeremiah says, I, I picked up your word, I ate your word, and they were a joy, and they were life to me. And so we need to eat the word of God, meditate, chew on it. And verse 24 in Ephesians 4 says, Put on the new man that was created by God in true righteousness and holiness. We need to get rid of the old man, you know, reprogram by thinking God's thoughts, put on that new man. Put on that new man created by God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. So, number one, start. it starts with our meditation. What are you meditating on? Are you meditating on God's word? Number two, embrace the wind. Embrace the wind. Any sailors in here? Any sailors in your house this morning? Are you a sailor? You love the wind. Embrace the wind. Realize that God is at work in this struggle, and that he'll never leave you or nor forsake, nor forsake you. He's making you stronger. He'll see you through. This is not the end. As a matter of fact, I would say that, you know, this virus thing, this is not the end. This is not the way it ends, folks. This, it's not over. This is something that we're going to get through by faith. We're going to get through and we're going to be victorious. And it's not over. It may, you know, it may be a tip of the iceberg. We're getting closer to that day when we believe that the Lord is going to appear and, and, uh, and you know, come back. But this is not it, I don't believe. But it's a sign, it's a warning to get your ticket. Get right with God. You know, I like to say, you know, if you're going to fly somewhere, you better have your ticket in advance. Yeah. Buy your ticket. Today would be a good day to get your ticket for heaven. And it's just it's so easy just receiving Jesus, the work that he did on the cross, the forgiveness that he provided for you. Get your ticket today. Get on board. Get ready to fly. Because he's coming back, and it won't be that long. But... Right now, we have time. You know, today we have time. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart, but receive him, open up to him. Embrace the wind. Realize that God is in the wind. It's not always the devil who's causing the wind. A lot of times we want to blame everything, any adversity, any hard stuff, any tough time. We want to blame it on the devil. And we want to, we're cursing the devil. And oftentimes, it's God who's causing the wind. And so we need to learn how to cooperate with God and go for it and embrace the wind. The third thing I would say is change your perspective. Change your perspective. Perspective is so big, it's, it's so huge. Uh, it's much like the first two points, you know, it starts with changing your meditation and embracing the wind, but perspective, changing your, pers your perspective is really thinking about what you really believe about the sovereignty of God compared to your situation. What do you really believe about who God is 
how big God is compared to your situation. Do you believe that God is bigger than your situation? Daniel obviously did. You know, he knew that God was bigger. And he said, you know, go ahead and put me in the fire. It doesn't matter. Because if God, God doesn't get me out of this fire, I'll be with him. He's greater than the fire. A fire doesn't stop God. Nothing stops God. And so compared to your situation, you've got to look at the sovereignty of God. I mean, he's unending. He knows no bounds. He, he's, he was in the beginning. He's in the end. He was before the beginning. And he's all the way through, man. He is God. And so put yourself in that place. What I believe that my God is bigger. That's what I really believe. My God is bigger. My God is stronger. My God is able. He always wins. How many ever, ever known, have ever known God to fail? God always wins. What I believe is I always win in him. We can be winners in Jesus. I want to just share a little story about uh, what happened to me some years ago. I went to, uh, uh, what was the, prom yeah, Promise Keepers, the big men's uh, kind of revival that they were having around the country and big arenas, a lot of men showing up at these things. And I went with a couple friends one time and we sat way up high and we didn't like our seats. It was in the old Metrodome in Minneapolis and it was hard to hear up there. And, and we were looking down for a closer spot and we spotted a place way down in the front. And uh, we thought, oh, look, at there's some open chairs down there. Let's go down there. So we, we work our way down to the front. We get down close and we see it's, it's for the handicapped people. And so I look at my one, my one friend and he starts going like this. And I'm thinking, nah, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and so we get up there and, and we sit down and he kind of limped in there. It was kind of funny, but when we sat down, the Lord convicted us so bad because we saw these handicapped people and some of them, you know, some of them didn't have any legs. Some of them didn't have arms or, you know, some of them were quadriplegics, paraplegics, all kinds of handicapped people. Some of them were blind other, and other things. And, and yet, if, if they could raise up a hand, they had a hand up like this, praising God. If they couldn't raise up a hand, they had their chin up, praising God. And it was like we were so convicted because we were so healthy and we, we kind of felt like we were sneaking into their zone here. But, you know, your perspective changes a little bit when you see... When you recognize how good you have it, how much you have to be thankful for it, how much you have to be grateful for it. And I looked at those guys and I thought, wow, look at them. They're praising God in the midst of their, in their struggle, in the midst of their shortcomings. They're really giving him glory. And I think they gave him more glory than we did and with our best praise. And so change your perspective. What's really happening? How big is your God? Number four, spend time. And this, is, this one is so big. Spend time in praise and thanksgiving. When you do, you'll develop an attitude of gratitude. When you begin to just thank God, and just like I was reading those psalms early, when you find yourselves in the psalms and just singing to God and praying to God, strength arises on the inside of you. You'll automatically begin to soar above your circumstances when you spend time in thanksgiving and praise. Giving thanks and praise to God is it's not just positive thinking. You know, so many people think, oh, that's just positive confession, positive thinking. No, it's, it's really a statement of faith that arises from the inside of you that comes out of your mouth and you're declaring who God is and you're, you're thanking him for who he is. And all of a sudden, faith arises. How many know that God actually, uh, he comes down and, and he kind of finds himself in that atmosphere. He, he inhabits, the Bible says, the praises of Israel. He'll come right into the room and you'll find yourself just enveloped in the in the witness of God and the witness of the Spirit and you'll find that his presence is there when you begin to praise him and thank him even in the hard times I would say even in the hard times you got to praise him more you got to thank him more and I'm telling you that faith will arise and faith will cause you to overcome faith will cause you to just stand up and just make a declaration I don't care what happens my God is on the throne I don't care what's going on around me. I win in Jesus. I don't care who you are or what you're doing. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to thank him. And guess what? You're victorious in that. And faith arises. God comes into that atmosphere. Go ahead and test me on this one. Just go ahead and praise him on your roughest day and see if he doesn't come right into your room, right into your car, right into your house, right into your atmosphere and just fill up the room. And that's what he does. He specializes in our weakness. He's strong in our weakness. And the way he's strong in our weakness is when we give him glory, and when we give him praise, and we shout his name, we declare him, we call on him in our, in our hardest times. And so spend more time in praise and thanksgiving. Really, you know, the Bible says that praise looks good on you. 
Some of you could use some of that good looking stuff. You know what I'm saying? Praise looks good on you. It'll cause your smile to be brighter. It'll cause you to just, you know, just be a happier person. I'm trying to smile right now, but I'm not a very good smiler. <laughs> My family actually makes fun of you, have fun of me when I try to smile for a picture. Come on, Mel, does your family make fun of you when you smile? No, I'm good looking. You're good looking. <laughs> so so I, I try to smile for a picture and I, I go like this. And I, I try to show my teeth, and I'm like, it doesn't look natural for me. I'm not a very good smiler. So they say, just smile natural. So I go, okay. <laughs> I don't know how to smile. But I'm telling you, when you're full of praise, you'll be prettier. People will be attracted to you. You'll be better looking. It looks good on you. I'm telling you, praise looks good on you. You ought to start that today because it'll help you. Amen. It also helps you to look good on the inside. And re remember, our attitude is a reflection of what's on the inside and it comes out when we praise so let me just close with this a couple final thoughts one thing is if your situation i guess this would be the fifth point if your situation seems like an all-out attack from the enemy then speak to it in jesus name you know sometimes we just have to be sharp enough and really god will give us the discernment to know if this is from the enemy or if this is from god but if it's from the enemy and you realize that this is the devil is after me and the devil's out to get he's doing something here then you just have to do like jesus and say peace be still shut up and get out take authority over that situation in jesus name i come against you in the name of jesus i command you to leave i command you to stop in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my life and my home, my family. And in Jesus' name, I break every curse. I break everything that you come against me with. In Jesus' name, my God is more powerful. And thank you, God, for the victory. And so that's what we have to do uh, if we feel like it's from the enemy. And sometimes it is. And so just stop him in Jesus' name. He's given you authority over all the power of the devil. So nothing can by any means stop you or hurt you. In Jesus' name. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you today. Let's pray about our attitudes. Let's just take a moment right now and, and just maybe a moment of silence and just say, God, what about my attitude? What about my attitude? You know, sometimes our attitude is, is uh, abundantly clear with those that we love. Those that are living in the same house with us. Those that we're married to or our children. Sometimes our attitude comes out kind of ugly. Because we kind of get used to people and we kind of, it's almost like, it's almost like we take advantage of them or we get too comfortable and it's like we have to work on our attitude every day and be willing to come to God every day and say, Lord, help me with my attitude, with my family, with my loved ones. I want to have a good attitude that reflects the love of Jesus in my heart. And so, Lord, help us with our attitude. Help us, Lord, to, to be lovers, to be gracious, to be giving, to be full of life, to be full of light. To be positive, Lord, and, and to look at things, Lord, through the lens of scriptures. And God, to understand how big our God is. Thank you, Lord, for creating us, as David prayed, a clean heart. And renewing a right spirit within me. Evidently, David knew that something was wrong with his spirit. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Lord, thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you that you go with us. Thank you that you're here today. And we bless your name. We bless your name. Let me just say a word. If you're watching with us today, you don't really know Jesus. Maybe you've never opened up your heart to him. Maybe you've never uh, you know, confessed your sin and asked Jesus to be your Lord and to live in you. And I want to give you that opportunity today to just say yes to him. Really, it's, it's that simple. If you're worried you know, about this virus and you're worried about all kinds of stuff, that's not God. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And so I want to invite you to just receive Jesus today. And uh, he'll come in and he'll rescue you from your sin. He'll give you eternal life and he'll bring peace and, and uh, a new kind of joy in your life that you've never experienced before. So let's pray together. Lord, if that's you, just pray with me right there in your home, wherever you are. Lord Jesus, thank you today for forgiving me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you, God, for giving me hope. Lord, I, I just want to put my trust in you today. I want to receive Jesus in my heart. Lord, I want to live for you. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Lord, would you come and live in me? And I thank you for that. Lord, help me to live as a believer. Help me to live as a Christian. Help me to find my, my way in your word and studying your word. 
Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for rescuing me. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I pray that uh, this helps you today with your attitude, and we will see you again. Our, our worship team is going to close with a song right now. Um, no longer slaves. Go, Sarah.